So welcome to Bible Mine. So tonight, I have three things that I want to cover in in this period of history that are uh, two people and one event that are significant in this period of history. So it's not going to be one that lends itself to a lot of theology like we've done. And so it'll be kind of some details. And then I have a scripture that I want to end with tonight. And so the first person that I would like to talk about, his name is Thomas Munzer. Has anybody ever heard of Thomas Munzer? Not Munster. That would be Herman. Uh, in, in <laughs> so it's not Herman Munster, but Thomas Munzer. Uh, he was born in Stahlberg, uh, Thuringia, which is Germany, okay, so we might as well say Germany for our purposes today. And uh, through his education at the University of Leipzig and the University of Frankfurt, Munzer became lingu a linguistic specialist in uh, Greek and uh, Hebrew and Latin, and so you know he knew all these all these languages. And he was an accomplished scholar of ancient and humanistic literature, uh, particularly the books of the Bible. So he was very very learned in the the books of the Bible. In 1518, he began to be attracted to the teachings of Martin Luther. Interested him, and he studied it out. And uh, the designation Martinian was first applied to, to Munster, Munster, <laughs> Munster. See, Munster. See, I even have trouble with it. See, when you crack a joke, then that joke gets in your head and, you know, you can't get it out. Uh, in, in 1519, after he spoke out against the Franciscan order, the Roman Catholic ecle ecclesiastical hierarchy and the veneration of the saints. And so when he came out against these things, you know, they, well, you sound like Martin Luther. And so that label was put on him. Between 1519 and 1520, he spent some time in a monastery and began to see a lot of things differently than the Catholic Church taught, but also saw things differently than Martin Luther was teaching. He had just a little bit different take on, on some of the things that he would read in, in the Bible as he studied the Bible. So in 1520... Munzer, uh, probably at Luther's uh, appointment or recommendation, served as pastor of Zwickau, and this is actually the, the church is still there that he was pastor in. Uh, there was, in, in the town of Zwickau, there was a lot of unrest and uh, between the upper class and the uh, common workers, <clears throat> and uh, Munzer sided with the common workers in this, uh, this up, uh, up unrest, is what I'm trying to say. More and more, he found himself opposed to Roman Catholic practices and Lutheran ideas uh, in, in Luther's ideas of reform. And so he was kind of you know, alienating himself even further. He began to be influenced by the teachings of Nicholas Storch. Uh, he was a leader of a group known as the Zwickau Prophets. And we're not going to go a lot into that. But these three uh, began to teach. Uh, they, they really believed in the imminent last days. Uh, they uh, believed that their authority in theological matters was not only driven by the Bible, but also direct revelations by the Holy Spirit. And so they, they would start teaching things that were a little outside of what Luther and the Catholic Church would teach. In 1521, Munzer and, and the Zwickau prophets were driven out of Zwickau. And this is the same year, if you remember, that uh, Martin Luther appeared before Charles V, uh, the f fifth at the Diet of <laughs> not Worms, Worms, and so uh, so this is this is kind of happening sim simultaneous to some of the things that we've studied. So the three prophets they go to Wittenberg and start a rebellion against the Catholic Church. So you remember when after the Diet of uh, Worms that. Uh, he was supposed to like be able to go say his last goodbyes or whatever, and then he was going to be executed, and he was kidnapped and, and taken into, into hiding, right? And he became, what was his persona that he kind of became in hiding? Knight George, or actually in that, in that language it would have been Yorye. Uh, so he, w he was Sir Yorye or, or, or Knight George, and so that Martin Luther was going around uh, kind of incognito as that. <laughs> so if you remember when we talked about it, what brought him out of hiding is 
he heard in Wittenberg or from Wittenberg that there was a lot of unrest and there was a rebellion going on. You remember that? So the rebellion was started by the Zwickau prophets. And so that's what he went back and, and confronted or whatever. So that's what happened there. Munzer goes to uh, the area around Prague to gain the support of the Taborites. Uh, they were a Bohemian group that uh, believed in the teachings of, anybody want to take a guess? John Hus. John Hus. John Hus. And so, uh, so that, he was going to kind of gain their support and, and uh, be part of their group. In Prague, uh, Munzer published a, a manifesto proclaiming the start of the final reformation and the emergence of a new church over which the Holy Spirit would reign. Munzer and Luther were opposed on the basis of authority. Luther believed that, the only, that only a literal reading of Scripture could drive theology. You, re, you remember when uh, Martin Luther, you know, he, he had the, the debate or whatever, and he's like, this is my body, this is, you know, because the Scripture said, this is my body, so it has to contain the body of Christ, you know. And, and so he, because he's a very literal, uh, very literal interpretation of Scripture, well, Munzer believed that the Holy Spirit could reveal truth. And so, uh, you know, a little, little, you know, they were kind of back and forth on that. Luther once said that Munzer had uh, swallowed the Holy Spirit, feathers and all. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what that means, but, you know, he thought he was being funny maybe or something. Now, now he probably wasn't being funny, but, you know, anyway, I added the commentary. Uh, he didn't really say this part here. So. <laughs> um Munzer got caught up in the Peasants' War, if you remember we talked about that, and he believed it to be the final struggle between good and evil. He became a leader in the uprising in central Germany, and they took over the governing council and set up what they called the Eternal Council, and Munzer assumed command of the local troops. Well, the revolt didn't really work out too good. Uh, Munzer was eventually captured, tried, and executed, and that was the end of him. And so you say, well, why, why are we even talking about him and bringing him up or whatever. So why this story? Munzer, uh, he was uh, misguided, of course, in, in several of his focuses, but it stands to show that there were people within the Reformation that were hungry for more than just another religion. They wanted more than, the, I mean, because the Catholic Church had become so re rigid in, in their religion, and Luther comes along, and it seems like they were just establishing another religion. And so there was a hunger, and even though Munzer, you know, we would say that he would be misguided in, in several areas, it shows that there was a hunger for more. They wanted more than just some type of rigid, uh, rigid religion, but they wanted, uh, wanted to, to have more from the Holy Spirit. It also serves to remind you that the Hussites are still around, and so we're going to uh, talk about them in... At some point toward the end of April, you're going to need to remember that the Hussites are still around. So there you go. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about tonight, the Catholic Reformation. <clears throat> I was about, I think, 14 years old, something like that. And good, my mom's not in here all of a sudden. So <laughs> telling stories about my childhood, you know, you got to be careful about that kind of stuff. Uh, I made a black powder bomb. We won't tell them. <laughs> oh, she knows. I, the, the first time I told this story was I was well into my adulthood. The first time I told it in her hearing, and she's like, "What else did you do that I didn't know about?" <laughs> and so, but I had a I had a muzzle loader, a black powder rifle, and so I had you know a pretty big container of black powder. Like, I could make like my own stick of dynamite here. And so I got some I got some typing paper, and you know I, I rolled up a pretty pretty big you know pretty big hefty uh, stick of black powder dynamite if you will, and you know closed off the ends and and I had some firecrackers, and so I took one of the long fuses out of the firecrackers and you know kind of rolled that up in there and that was going to be the fuse and so me and my friend who happened to be a deacon's kid I was pastor's kid he was a deacon's kid so you know you got to watch when you get those two combinations together. So I laid it at the edge of the ditch, and I was going to light the fuse and run. What could happen, right? What could go wrong? <laughs> and so when I laid it at the edge of the ditch, and it was, it was dark, and I laid it at the edge of the ditch, and I tried to light it, well, dew had already fallen, so the fuse got wet. So I thought, 
I'll just light the paper. <laughs> and so I had it all planned, okay? So uh, I'm down in, my, uh, down in my stance like this, and I'm going to light. This is matches. This is before the big trigger lighter things, right? So I had a match. And I was going to light the paper. As soon as I saw the least little spark, then I would jump out of the way, right? And so as soon as I saw a spark, I got this far. And it's, <laughs> have you all ever seen black powder blow up? So it's not a real concussive kind of thing. It's just like a, just like a real fast flash. And so it, it, it blew up literally in my face. And when I turned around, I, I did have some type of reflexes because I, I had closed my eyes. And when I turned around, I opened my eyes. And so right where I had closed my eyes right here was white, but the rest of my face was black and my eyebrows were gone, and my hair was gone, uh, like straight up like that, burned off. And fun times. How did you have God only knows. <laughs> well, they, <laughs> what you do is you slip in, and you kind of go back, and you wash up, you know, and kind of, you know, cut the, cut the hair. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so what's the point of that story? The point of the story is that uh, through, through heavy-handed religious oppression, the Catholic Church uh, lit the fuse of, uh, of the Reformation. And for years, they had tried to keep it from going off. You know, you had people like Peter Waldo and John Huss and John Wycliffe and all these people that would be, would be, would be, would be, would be, would be reformers. They would be, would be reformers. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to leave all that in there. Uh, <laughs> but they were, they were executed. They were, they were you know, killed for trying to uh, initiate the, the Reformation. But by the time Martin Luther came along, the cry for Reformation was so great that they could no longer contain it, and it literally blew up in their face. And so with so many doctrinal splits out there, the Catholic uh, Church decided that, you know, uh, we haven't had a council in a very long time, so maybe we should have our own Reformation and, and uh, figure a few things out. They got together for what's called the Council of Trent, and this is a pretty significant council in the history of the Catholic Church, and that's why I wanted to bring up just a little bit about it. Now, it looks like it was a very long council, 18 years, but it was really in three phases, so we'll talk briefly about the three phases, and so it wasn't continuous for 18 years, but it was all called the Council of Trent. And so from the, you might say, well, you know, why didn't they have a council before this, or why didn't they, uh, you know, uh, try to, to do something about the, the, this Protestantism that kind of blew up? The reason was because if you remember, uh, Martin Luther, he wasn't trying to split off of the Catholic Church, was he? He was trying to reform the church from within, and, and all that he wanted, when he uh, you know, nailed the 30, 95 thesis to the door, all that he wanted was to have a council. That's what the invitation was. Let's have a council and let's, let's decide these things. And uh, that was his intent all the way up to the Diet of Worms when they were going to kill him, and so it was like, I don't think the council's going to happen now, <laughs> and so we have to go get a different direction. But just a few decades before that, you remember when we were talking about the, uh, the, the great papal schism and there was a you know, period of time that there was even three popes and all that craziness that was going on. It was decided, do you remember how it was decided? By council, right? So they had a council to untangle all that. And during that council, they had taken some of the power away from the pope and the church was going to be run by council. Well, that didn't last very long. Eventually, there were still councils, but the ultimate decision of theological matters and, and uh, things that were ruled actually had to be you know, approved by the Pope. And so the Pope still maintained that power. And so because of all this, they really didn't want to have you know, a lot of authority given to a council. So they were real resistant to having a lot of councils. And so that's why they, they just didn't want to do this. But uh, eventually they decided, you know, okay, we got to have at least a council and figure a few things out. So finally, one year before Luther dies, the first session was held in what's called the Council of Trent. 
And uh, that sounds like a, a, a long time, but phase one started in 1545. Um, the phase, this phase was, it was a couple of years, but this phase was mostly doctrinal in nature. There were three main things that came out of it. The first is justification, which is you know, Martin Luther's big, big thing that, that he had uh, broken away about. In 1400 years of the church, they had never really addressed salvation. You know, what is justification? What is salvation? What, you know, what, what, what are these things? It was just, uh, you know, they had talked about other issues like the deity of Christ and, you know, all these things that, that they had to decide by counsel, but they had never really talked about core values and basic values such as this. And so the council decided that you are justified by faith working itself out in love. And that's, that's basically the way that they had uh, defined that. And so this gives them a way to say that faith saves us, yes, but still trying uh, works in the process. Remember uh, penance and, and all of those things, right? It was part of the, the Catholic way. And so they didn't want to walk all that back. And so they, this left them like a little bit of wiggle room. And, you know, you're saved by faith, but it works itself out uh, in love or uh, practically in, in uh, works. The Catholic Church did believe that we're saved by faith, but would stop short of saying by faith. What's the word that Martin Luther would use? By faith. Alone, right. And so they, they would stop short of saying that. Protestants believed works were important and that you should do them, but they did not contribute to justification. And, of course, we believe that uh, we're saved by faith alone, but that our works are the evidence or the fruit of our salvation. Okay? Um, so as James says, Without works, our faith is dead. Very good. The second thing that they covered in phase one was the Vulgate. This phase really doubles down on the Vulgate being the like the the Bible, the the authoritative Bible. And that didn't mean that uh, the vernacular versions couldn't exist. They had to be approved by the church, and they could be used in some situations. But any time. Anything had to be decided doctrinally, or if they were going to like uh, teach from it or or do anything, it had to be from the Vulgate because this was this was the authoritative. Uh, you know, this is the one that that's our foundation, and so they doubled down on that. The third thing was tradition. The Catholic Church has a, a, a lot of different traditions that are held. We would say on the level of Scripture. Okay, they wouldn't quite define it that way. But that's the way that it comes across. Protestants, in an effort to break away from the grip of the Catholic Church, would declare, "We don't have any traditions. Right? We, we, you know, we're we're traditionless. You know, and and you know, we sometimes we even have those arguments in our own circles, right? You know, like, oh, we don't we don't want to get stuck on tradition, but we have traditions, don't we? You know, and so even though Protestantism had broken away and were saying, you know, that we don't have any traditions." They didn't do away with the, the Christian calendar. You know, they didn't do away with Easter tradition. They didn't do away with Christmas as a tradition. Uh, they still had the, the sacraments of baptism and, and um, uh, uh, communion. And so there were some things that, that they, uh, you know, didn't do away with. So they, they had traditions, but just in their, in their mind, you know, they were like, we don't have traditions, right? It reminds me of a story that I, I've heard many times about the uh, Pentecostal preacher that went to a more liturgical church and uh, he was given a program. You know, he looked at it and I mean, it was the order of service, just one right after another. You know, we're going to sing this song and we're going to do this and then we're going to stand and read this scripture. And, you know, and, and he just kind of smiled and the guy asked him what? And he said, you know, we, we don't uh, have to write our services down like that. And I said, that's okay. You know, we, we write ours down. You just have yours memorized. <laughs> and so, you know, we, I mean, we do follow the same, you know, same tradition. We have a traditional order of service that we follow, right? And so we may not say we have traditions, but Protestantism is full of traditions nonetheless. The Council of Trent served to double down on a church tradition, and they would, say, they would not say that church tradition is equal to Scripture, but that if a tradition has been approved by council and the pope, 
they become authoritative interpretations of expression and practice. So, for example, you know, beliefs on Mary and purgatory and the rosary and icons and those things are church traditions. Some of those things aren't really founded in scripture, but they were traditions of the church. And so they hold those on the same level as following uh, certain scriptures. Phase two <clears throat> was in 1551. This faith had more to do with uh, addressing the Reformation. There were a, a, a number of Lutherans that were actually invited to be at this council. They couldn't talk. You know, y'all can just sit over there and watch, and we're going to put on a show for you or whatever. Uh, but the main doctrinal issue discussed in this session was uh, trans, uh, transubstantiation. Now, Luther believed that there was, if you remember, there was a physical pres presence somehow of Christ in there. He wouldn't go as far as to say it was a, a physical substance, but mysteriously somehow Christ has to be present in. But the Catholic Church had always said, no, there has to be, uh, you have to believe that the substance of Christ is in the elements. If you don't believe that, then you're not saved. And so that's where they landed on that. Let's look at, though, if to, to understand it, let's look at the words. First of all, the, the word transformation, okay? Transform. So if I was to transform into Bigfoot, let's say, then what would have to happen? Hair would you know, sprout out all over my body. I'd have to grow about two feet. You know, my, my uh, feet would have to pop out of my shoes, right? And just right before your eyes here, you know, I would turn into this big hairy beast. I would be transformed into Bigfoot. Any Hulk fans? When, when he would transform into Hulk, what would happen? He would turn green, his shirt would rip down the back, you know, and then he'd smash. I mean, that's what Hulks do. They smash. And so uh, that's, that's transformation, all right? This is not what the Catholic Church believes about the elements. If so, the, the bread would literally turn into flesh, right? It, it would look like, you know, a piece of an arm or something like that. Uh, the, the blood, the, the wine would literally turn into blood and smell like, you know, so that's not what they believe. They believe in transubstantiation, and I know we've talked about this before, but we've never really broken down the words. It means that the substance is what changes, not the form, but just the substance. So to give you a little example of what that means, what you see right here, this is my form, right? But my substance or my essence is who I am. So if I was in an accident and uh, my car rolled or whatever and I lost a leg and my face was burned, it would change my form, right? But I'm still me. The substance of who I am is still the same, even though I may look different and you might have to wince a little bit when you talk to me, uh, I would still be me because my substance. So what the Catholic Church taught about the elements is that it, it doesn't change form, but the very substance of those elements turns into the body of Christ and into the blood of Christ. And that's that's you have to believe that that, ha you know, because I would say, if you want to believe that, that's fine. I, I'm, you know, if you want to take communion and believe that that's happened, I don't believe that it does. But if you want to believe that it isn't, you know, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Or, but it does them to me. Because I don't believe that, then it's a big deal. And so in the Council of Trent, they doubled down on transubstantiation. We're not backing down on that. You have to believe that the substance of the elements change. Phase three is in 1562. This phase makes clear there would be no reconciliation with uh, Lutheranism or Protestantism whatsoever. We're, not, you know, we're, we're burning the bridge. We don't even care. And so maybe they didn't say we don't care, but they're, you know, we're not giving. We're not going to try to reconcile. Y'all have broken away from the church, so we're right. Y'all are wrong. Uh, you know, enjoy hell or whatever. And so uh, that, this is uh, what they doubled down on on that. They reaffirmed the doctrine of purgatory. They reformed their position on relics. If you remember, <clears throat> we've talked about this a little bit, especially during the Crusades. 
a lot of things were found in the Holy Land and brought back and, and been able to be sold. And I don't know if y'all have seen uh, maybe a documentary or something, and some church is like, this is a splinter from the cross, and you know, this person is like, well, this is a thorn from the crown of thorns. And I mean, there were a lot of stuff like that floating around. So one thing they did at the Council of Trent is to come up with a way to better bet what's a real relic and what somebody's just trying to, you know, be a shyster about some, you know, splinter of wood or something. And they put a lot of things in place to, to maybe vet that. And they're not, I mean, I don't know how you know anyway if you have a splinter of wood, if it actually came from the, you know. But they tried to do a better job at that. They passed regulations on indulgences. Remember, that was one of the big deals with, with Luther is the selling of indulgences. That's what was kind of like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And so uh, they, they come up with uh, new rules on indulgences. One, the most significant was you can't sell indulgences. So that, you know, that may have you know, helped some of, the, some of the corruption anyway. New regulations on who would be bishops. Remember, we've talked about in several times and, and places, people being exalted to even pope and bishops and things like that based on who they were, how much money they contributed, uh, what uh, you know, lineage they had, things like that. And so the Cap Catholic Church decided at uh, the Council of Trent that we're going to have reforms as to the process of becoming a bishop and you know, we want to make sure it's more of a spiritual thing and not so much of who you know kind of thing. And so that came out of this. And the last thing was new educational funding throughout Europe. And they really had an emphasis on, on education and, and building schools and financing schools and, and sending money out. And that's a ripple effect that even comes down to us today. Uh, you have, uh, what's, some, what's some Catholic universities that you know today? Notre Dame. Notre Dame, first one that comes to mind. What about St. John? What? Loyola. Loyola. Good. There's one that ought to be on Arkansas's fan, uh, uh, mine this week. What's that? Gonzaga. So Gonzaga is a, a Catholic university. So all these, all these universities really are a ripple effect from what happened at the Council of Trent and their dedication to we're going to make sure that education is important. So the council was overseen by three different popes, and Tridentine, Tridentine Catholicism is, is a word. It just means, that means from the Council of Trent. So Tridentine uh, Catholicism really hung around for about 300 and some things even for 400 years because uh, in the 1800s you had Vatican I, which means the, the first council that was held at the Vatican and then Vatican II in the 1900s and, and so we'll, we'll talk about those when the time came but the, the tri, uh, Tridentine uh, Catholicism would be uh, uh, really a, a defining time for the Catholic Church for hundreds of years afterwards. It issued key statements and clarifications on the church's doctrines and teachings on scripture, uh, the biblical canon for example on what books and this was in large part to uh, Protestantism had rejected the deuterocanonical canonical books, which you know we call the Apocrypha. If you know, we've talked about some of those books. Basically, put it like this: the books that the Catholic Church say that are Scripture that's not in your Bible, that's the ones we're talking about. At the Council of Trent, they decided they doubled down on okay, all these books are still part of Scripture. Uh, the Tridentine Mass that was established then really remained the church's primary form of mass for the next 400 years to Vatican II. And so there was, a, that's why I wanted to cover this just briefly. We didn't get very deep, but uh, just wanted to let you know about the Council of Trent and the significance in the Catholic Church. Let's move on to this fellow right here, Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius was from northern part of Spain. He was a soldier in 1521, and he shattered his leg in a battle. And there wasn't a lot you could do about things like that then. You know, I mean, you just had surgery, and they, you know, they put you under, right? You didn't feel a thing till later, till the medicine started wearing off. Then you felt it, you know. But I mean, there was no, there was no painkiller. There, you know, you shattered your leg, and you just, you had to lay up until. You know, good luck with that. <laughs> and so he was in bed for a very long time. During this time, he turned to prayer and really started focusing on God and, and praying and reading the Word and meditating on the Lord. And during this time, uh, he also 
uh, he read many of the works of uh, 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 like Francis of Assisi and some of the other church fathers, and, and he wanted to be like them. He wanted to have the, just the closeness to God that these guys did. And he started meditating and praying. He developed a, a method of prayer that a lot of people still use today. That he would, uh, when, when he would pray, he would visualize himself in like what, whatever situation. The first one that comes to mind is like if, he, if he's praying and, and focusing on the nativity, then he would envision himself as he's there you know, when, when Jesus was born and, and things like that. So this just real uh, meditative uh, type of prayer. Uh, when his leg recovered, he took a trip to the Holy Land and he laid his sword down as a soldier at the shrine to Mary there in the Holy Land. And one thing that came out of this was the Jesuits. Anybody ever heard of the Jesuits? His prayer and meditation methods became popular, and by 1534, he had a following. His small group, including his friend uh, Francis Xavier, and we've talked about him just briefly in the past, but uh, they... Uh, vow to take monastic vows and form the Society of Jesus, and that's what we call the Jesuits. In 1540, Pope Paul III accepts the Jesuit order as an official monastic order under the church. And who, who knows some of the other orders we've talked about? The Franciscans. Okay, Franciscans, after Francis of Assisi. There's the Augustinians. The Dominicans, the, and actually this order uh, that it was uh, accepted that quickly was faster than any of the other orders that were accepted, so it was kind of fast-tracked. Ignatius Rice, uh, a work called Spiritual Exercises in 1548, and it became the official Catholic teaching on prayer, and still is in a lot of ways. The Jesuits became defenders of the Catholic Church and the Pope, and the primary force to counter the Reformation. So these were the these were the guys that would you know enforce uh, sometimes even to the point of taking up arms. They were also uh, very uh, capable missionaries. So the Pope, you know, if there was a an area that there wasn't a presence of of the Catholic Church in, he would send the Jesuits and they would start a church and and be missionaries to that area. Uh, if there was some trouble brewing with some Protestants, the Jesuits were the ones that he would send to straighten straighten those Protestants out. And uh, so they were they were very loyal to the church, and they were very loyal to the Pope. And 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 it's really the office of the Pope. So it wasn't like you know Pope Paul or any particular person that they were loyal to. They were loyal to the office of the per, uh, Pope. This was summarized in the motto, "Perinde a cadaver." Anybody know what that means? Hey, how'd you know? <laughs> you do know what cadaver is. And so this was their, uh, somebody just take a stab at what that means to you. What, what kind of do you think they were meaning by that being their motto? Okay, they died to self. Okay, right. And so they they took on that, you know, we're, we're dead to ourself and, and we're living our life for Christ and uh, through the our loyalty to the church and to the Pope. We have, we have that as well. In the Assemblies of God, we have a movement called the Live Dead. And, and they go to these places that if they're found out that they're Christians, they'll be killed. I mean, that's today. And so when we have some that come through here, that's why we don't stream those services because if it got back to their field, then they wouldn't be allowed back. And if they do, they could face death. Uh, the Jesuit order, uh, it lives on. Somebody already mentioned, I think it was, you mentioned Loyola. So there's Loyola University in Chicago and in New Orleans. And so those are, those are the Jesuits. Uh, does any, anybody know a famous Jesuit? Now, the first one that I thought of was that guy. Anybody know him? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Like one person. Okay, I thought everybody knew Father Mulcahy. <laughs> oh, okay. Huh? So did y'all know he was a Jesuit? No. Okay, so he was, and he, he went to Loyola University. Okay, so now you learn something that you can really take out of here. And, and re- oh, <laughs> that, that was the chaplain on MASH. Remember that? Oh, real life. I guess I didn't watch Okay. He's a real life. I don't know about real life, but 
his character, he was a, a Jesuit priest. And there is, there is one other Jesuit that's uh, kind of historical right now. The current pope is the first Jesuit pope. It seems a little uh, controversial, and in, in, in there's been a lot said about this because the, the uh, Jesuits, what's, what's their big mission? Support the Pope. Now we we are the Pope, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there were, there were some people that kind of pushed back about that just a little bit. But anyway, so that that's the Jesuits. If there's one quality that we got out of this that the Jesuits had, what was that? Loyalty. 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 It seems like that's kind of a lost art these days, isn't it? Is loyalty. You, know, you don't you don't have to be loyal to anything anymore. You know if it, if a uh, you know, your your husband or wife aren't act, uh, acting right. Uh, just throw them away and get another one. Get a dog. Get a dog. <laughs> if if your if your kid you know if your kid disappoints you, disown them. You know, just just do away with them. Uh, if you, if your pastor makes a mistake or your church hurts you, just get another. Right. Uh, and when when things don't go your way, you can turn on your friends and your employer or your country or or you know whatever. And it seems just perfectly normal today just to be disloyal. And uh, myself, like most people, I mean, I have I have a lot of faults. I have one or two strengths. One of my strengths, if I was to say one, would be loyalty. I mean, I I have the same insurance agent. With one caveat, actually, I've been with the same insurance agency all of my adult life. It's just that that agency, uh, the the lady that we signed up with, retired and her son took over. So you know, it's a different agent. But so you, you know, I don't change character. The, the the carriers to my cell phone is the the same cell phone carrier that I've had since I first got a cell phone. I mean, I just I'm just a loyal guy, and so. You can take this out of that. If I'm your friend now, you're stuck with me. Even if you quit liking me, I'm still your friend. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> you're not going to get rid of me that soon. I just believe in loyalty. And it saddens me to see uh, how, how lightly some people take just that, that sense of sticking with somebody. I believe in being loyal to the pastor. We have a new pastor coming. And so we have an opportunity to be loyal to this pastor. Uh, and I, I'm excited about that. But I don't really like this process that, you know, and, and Jeremy and I talked about it a little bit this week, that, you know, we're, we're going to bring a, a pastor in, a man of God, a God that's called to be a pastor. And then as a committee, you know, we feel like, you know, this is who God's leading here and God's made this connection. But then we're going to bring him in and we're going to vote. You know, that... That's a very American thing to do. You know, that, that's not the way pastors were you know, put over churches in, in the first century. You know, I'm not even proposing a change. I'm not saying we need to do it. I'm just saying the, the weird thing about that is when you vote in a pastor, then that gives the feeling that the pastor then is accountable to you. And that's not the way that it's supposed to be. The, the shepherd is not accountable to the sheep. The sheep are accountable to the shepherd. And I, I believe God's going to direct and God moves through all of those things, even though as flawed as they may be, God's a big enough God to do what he does in spite of all that. But once we get past all of that, let's don't set the pastor up of, well, you know, if we don't like you, we'll just vote you out. <laughs> That's not the way it works. And so... I just want to say that as a little encouragement to you that, that you know, let's, and I don't want to overuse this phrase, row together, but man, if we would just get in the boat and we would, we would all row the same direction, how far can we go? Instead of you're rowing this way and I'm rowing this way and the boat's just going round and round and round and we're not getting anywhere, you know. I'm <laughs> just getting dizzy. And so I want to encourage us, what if we, went by this scripture, Colossians 3, 12 through 15. And this isn't just about the pastor, but this is just church people in general, okay? It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 
compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. That phrase right there, somebody defined that for me one time, and it, it just stuck with me that 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 means overlooking one another's undesirable traits. Raise your hand if you have undesirable traits. We all have we all have undesirable traits. How many of you would appreciate it if someone would overlook your undesirable traits? So therefore, how much important more important is it for us to do the same for others? Verse 13, bear with one another and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, we struggle with that a little bit, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's, that's something just to meditate on. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Pastor Greg was talking about this morning, you know, how sometimes we get in a rut of, of complaining about things. How much better would it be if we as a people would just be thankful? And that's why I like to start out when we come in here, you know, let's, let's have some testimonies. Let's talk about the good things God's done. Raise your hand if you can think of instantly, just like when I say this, you instantly think of something bad going on in the world. But when I say, okay, somebody tell me something good, I mean, it's like I've got to get out of the pry bar. Come on, come on, somebody has something good to say, surely. You know? But I promise you, more good happened to you this week than bad. And be thankful.